Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's nice to see so many of you out tonight. Thank you for um, braving the apparently returning cold weather to, to be here. Um, uh, well, uh, principally, I'm going to talk about, um, obviously, the Lunar Rover and uh, drawing on stories that we collected for uh, the second Haynes Manual that, um, that I wrote with my co-authors, David Woods and Phil Dolling, last year to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the, the car's last drive on the moon um, during Apollo 17. And so... Um, when we were writing the book, in fact, we, we suggested to Haynes, given that their, their pedigree is a, a, a car uh, uh, manual sort of publisher, uh, that they did the Lunar Rover quite quickly after we, we did the Apollo 11 book. But they weren't really sure where the space sort of sold, and so they kind of parked the project for a while. And, um, and David Woods, who's the editor of the uh, Apollo Flight Journal and lives up in Glasgow, he's a BBC uh, film editor, pro video editor up there, um, contacted me again at the end of uh, 2010 and said, hey, why don't we do the Lunar Rover book? And we said, well, look, Haynes weren't that, that interested in it, but why don't we dust off the proposal and put your name on it as well and let's, let's go back to them with it and see what they say. And, uh, and so this time they said, well, you, the Apollo 11 book sold quite well, so yeah, why don't we? So they commissioned us um, with hardly any time left to write it. I think we had sort of 10 weeks to write the thing. Um, and it was only through the expertise, really, of David Woods, whose knowledge of, of the whole Apollo daisy chain to get men to the moon and back uh, is really second to none. Um, he was already an author of uh, Apollo books, Apollo, How We Flew to the Moon, a bestseller by Praxis. And so having him as a, a co-writer on this was really key. Many of the technical chapters in this book actually are his, and I'm going to try and bluff my way through them tonight. But please don't uh, push my knowledge too far for anything too technical. Although I've hopefully helpfully put up his Twitter handle on uh, the screen as well there. If you've got anything really technical that comes up tonight that I can't answer, then m maybe we can tweet him. <laughs> um, so anyway, on with the story. So this, this is the story of the most exotic vehicle ever built. It cost $38 million um, back then, about $450 million in today's terms, to manufacture just three working examples. It's therefore the most expensive car in history. And the reason for that is that although it has wheels, of course, um, in every other sense, it was a spacecraft with the inherent costs uh, which uh, such a project to build a spacecraft dictates. So constructed from lightweight aerospace materials and designed to operate in a vacuum of space, immersed, in this case, in abrasive dust as well of the lunar surface, and hence the price tag. Um, you know, it's easy to forget that it was just 10 years between um, the first human being to fly in space, Yuri Gagarin, in April 1961, and mankind's first drive on another world in the summer of 1971. Uh, quite an epic uh, decade, I think you'll all agree. Um, and perhaps more surprisingly still, the rover was actually only commissioned um, uh, with um, uh, 18 months, 17 or 18 months to go before delivery. Um, and also when uh, human beings had only just um, walked on the moon. In fact, it was uh, this statement of work went out just before the flight of Apollo 11. So we hadn't even placed our first footprint on the moon. And here was this desire in future missions to build a car to drive there. Um, uh, a frankly kind of audacious proposal um, at the time. Um, but if you like, it signified uh, NASA's commitment to human exploration at this time, and it did symbolise a future of people living and working on other worlds. Um, and really, I think, and in writing this, this became apparent, this book, writing the book, that to understand the story of the lunar rover is really to understand NASA at its finest and most potent. So the engineers would have then, in that um, statement of work, to deliver a car capable of driving then in the vacuum of space. It had to be extremely light, um, about the same weight as a sit-on lawnmower, and yet at the same time able to carry twice its own weight in men and kit uh, and life support systems. Now, compare that to the average family car, which can only carry about a third to a half its own weight, and you realise what a, uh, a tough engineering challenge it would, would have to be, carrying twice its own weight. On top of that, then, of course, it would have to fold into a space half its length to fit into that bay that you can see where it's folded out from in that artist's impression uh, on the bottom of the lunar module. Deployment, of course, as well, would have to be quick and effective because it needed to be um, extracted from that lunar module and, and built by two men working in pressure suits on a very tight schedule. And as I mentioned before, all this had to be done in just 17 months. 
Well, that was clearly an impossible task. And actually, it was only made possible thanks to a previous century of dreaming about driving on the moon and a concerted ec- um, uh, effort of decades of feasibility studies that ran up to 1969 um, before that commissioning document was um, proposed. Um, and I'll come on to some of the details of the potential sort of locomotion possibilities in a second, but at the time, it wasn't just a simple wheel that was, was perhaps considered as a way of, um, of breaking through uh, the engineering challenges of driving on the moon. The thing then about this story that follows is that, um, as Arthur C. Clarke said in 1954, probably no achievement of the human mind has been so well documented before the event as has the conquest of space. And that um, quote of his is really epitomised, I think, by the detailed planning and forethought that went into building the lunar rover. And the thought about driving on the moon then started uh, over a century ago, 1901, um, when the Polish writer Jerez Zalowski, um, and his books are upstairs, I think, in the library here, um, uh, in his science fiction novel on the Silver Globe, uh, described the first sort of attempt to, 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 to suggest a pressurised lunar rover with tractor-like wheels that could be removed and a pressurised cabin used as a boat um, in this case. It had a top speed of 10 kilometres per hour, which actually wasn't far off what the, the final um, lunar rover was capable of. And in another twist of serendipity, um, one of the characters in his novel was called Braun. Um, but that's where um, the similarities, as you can see, uh, rather end. Um, Not that long after then, in 1918, the Russian pioneer of astronautics, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, described a lunar rover in his early novels. And his pressurised two-seater vehicle had electrically powered wheels and a small booster rocket for getting across those annoying crevasses. Uh, (laughs) But the electrically powered wheels, again, weren't far off what we eventually ended up with. Well, here's a slightly less practical version from a 1923 novel um, by the science fiction writer Homer Flint. Uh, His bipedal rover is um, from his book, Out of the Moon. And uh, you might also have come across an equally impractical solution by the Scully Anthony Corporation from the 1950s. So jump of a few decades later, this inflatable dumbbell that he proposed, they proposed to roll around the surface of the moon, um, the astronauts breathing the air inside. Uh, Things didn't get a lot better uh, four years later when Herman Oberth's outlandishly unstable spherical pressurised Um, contraption here with uh, a cabin five metres in diameter sitting on top of a column also five metres high was proposed. This um, monstrous thing weighed uh, about 1.6 tonnes and Oberth suggested it would cruise the lunar surface at 150 kilometres an hour. He he wasn't a man concerned with engineering practicalities it seemed at certain points in his life. Um, Well bringing things a bit more down to um, uh, reality I guess uh, you could say was um, this much more, um, much simpler and, and, and much closer to the, the, the final lunar rover design that um, one of your members actually came up with in 1950, Ralph Smith. Some of you might um, know of Ralph's work. He was a great artist and he did restore some sort of sense to the whole concept of lunar roving vehicles um, with this open top to unpressurised Jeep in, in, in a 1950 illustration. And about the only thing actually he got wrong with this was that he made it um, a right-hand drive vehicle. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and, and actually, in fact, um, as many of you might know and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss later, uh, the, the final lunar rover was a sort of centrally driven one, so either, either um, astronaut could operate it. Well, um, bringing us a, a bit closer to, to the, the, the realities of, of driving on the moon then, in 1959, Werner von Braun was heading up the Army's ballistic missile agency in, uh, in America. And he decide, decided to look into this lunar transportation system for their plans for a moon base that was called Project Hor- Horizon, which, again, some of you might, have, might know of. Um, now, Project Horizon uh, was an elaborate attempt to kind of create a, a moon base for, for, for the U.S., um, uh, army and as part of it um, a transportation system was required you can, you can see a kind of concept at the bottom there with a with a sort of articulated trailer um, and what von Braun um, decided to do was to put the word out there that um, to the car companies that that um, uh, you know America was looking for an extraterrestrial vehicle um, General Motors then got involved and they uh, appointed one of their engineers called Sam Romano to look into it Now, Romano recruited uh, the legendary um, engineer, motoring um, and mobility engineer, uh, Gregor Becker, who brought with him the the chap on the right there, Ferenc Pavliks. And together, Pavliks 
and um, Romano, although this, this original concept that they, they worked on in those early days in 1959 didn't go anywhere for Project Horizon, it brought together this core team of people, Becker, Pavlix, um, and, um, and uh, Romano, and that's Becker there um, working on some of his early designs. And this, this team, this trio of people, would actually be really instrumental in, in the final design, although it was quite a contorted um, route to get there. Um, General Motors, of course, weren't the only uh, people that were involved uh, in these early brainstorms of driving on the moon. As this clip I'm going to show you next illustrates, this is from a series called Moon Machines that um, I made for the Discovery Science Channel a few years ago. Well, as some of you might remember, the, the subsequent surveyors also um, confirmed this strength to the lunar, lunar surface that they uh, hadn't been sure about before. Um, so much so, in fact, that um, the car companies started to get kind of carried away because the engineering data coming back rather suggested that a substantial wheeled vehicle could actually be supported. Um, at least that's what the surveyor data was suggesting. And as you saw in that video and here again in this still picture, I mean, some of these vehicles were really preposterous pieces of sort of farming equipment, really. Um, cu culminating perhaps in, in the heaviest one here, this MOLAB concept from 1964, um, which weighed in at something like three and a half tons. Um, it, was, it was so heavy that, in fact, uh, as, you, as you'll notice in the background here on this, this picture, this is actually the, 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 the top uh, of, a, of a Saturn V um, on the left-hand side here. So I've lost my pointer. Well, you can see it here. Um, uh, with, with the perspex uh, sh showing what was inside. And the MOLAB would have sat at the top of the Saturn V. It would have had its own Saturn V rocket to get it to the moon. Um, and the astronauts would have gone separately. Um, and this whole idea was getting so ridiculous that in, um, uh, in the same year, in 1964, uh, NASA's deputy administrator, Bob, Bob Siemens, uh, cancelled the rover program altogether, um, joking that Kennedy had only tasked them with landing a man on the moon and not providing him with a car. Um, <laughs> Now that, and that was it, and it seemed like all of this work was for nothing, and, and it was really over. And it was against orders that, that um, the Marshall um, Space Flight Center, which was run by Von Braun by that time, pressed on with various feasibility studies of sort of slimmed down rover concepts. Sa Sam Romano on the left um, put his head together as well with um, Frank Pavlix there, uh, and carried on working, unpaid on this. I mean, GM were paying him, but GM weren't getting any money from NASA to do this. They carried on with these feasibility studies of how they might fly a slimmed-down rover to the lunar surface. Um, and by 1968, they were ready to go to Von Braun. Well, we must do this. T t turning uh, turning um, Pav Pavlik's model into the real thing was going to be a tough challenge in 17 months. You might think after all that effort, incidentally, that um, Von Braun would have just given GM the job and got, told them to get on with it. But um, being NASA, they couldn't really do that. So they put it out to tender and uh, um, pr principally four companies came back with designs for uh, a folding lunar rover, of which General Motors was just one of them. Um, General Motors, knowing they didn't have much aerospace experience, had paired up with Boeing by then. And um, really, the only reason they, they, they were successful in the end at winning uh, was that they, uh, with Boeing, they'd, Boeing had guaranteed to do it at such a low price that um, NASA really couldn't um, say no. But that low price was ultimately going to um, cost them uh, a lot more. <laughs> so anyway, turning that model into the real thing was going to be tough in those 17 months. Um, there were essentially eight engineering subsystems in the rover. There's the mobility that... I don't know if this is going to work. This, uh, is that pointing? Well, you can all see where the wheels are, I suppose. Um, the mo there was a mobility system, which was the chassis, the wheels, the suspension. The electrical power, which was the, the batteries, which were housed right at the front, just between the two front wheels. Um, and then thermal regulation, which essentially was, um, was the paint on the surfaces, various heat sinks, thermal straps, mm -hmm. wax reservoirs, in fact, to cool things down, to take latent heat away and to warm things, space radiators. The thermal regulation was a, a, a big part of this and a tough challenge given the extremes of temperature that the thing would have to operate in on the, on the lunar surface. Navigation was another system um, with the distance and bearing recorders that were, were needed. Um, and then the communication system, which hung off the very um, 
uh, front end of the uh, lunar rover and was there then connected to the high gain antenna which is pointing uh, vertically upright in that image. The crew station then was another system with the folding seats, uh, the footrest, the seat belt, the hand controller, which we'll come on to, and the armrest, and the in and the outbound tow holds. Remembering, of course, that this was an open vehicle and it was pretty bumpy on the moon and it was easy to fall out of this thing, um, though the crew station was really kind of key to holding them in. Um, and then, um, penultimately, the control and display console, which you can just see in front, uh, behind the map. The map is hanging, just masking it, which um, gave the, uh, the drivers all the information they needed, um, showing navigation speed, vehicle's attitude, electrical power controls, um, battery health, and that kind of thing, temperatures. And something you can't see here, uh, which was the stowage and deployment system, a, a subsystem in itself that allowed um, the two suited astronauts to unfurl it from the lunar module in, um, in about 15 minutes, flat. Um, as I've said before, then, they had to deliver this by April 1971, about 17 months away. At the time, in fact, for use on Apollo 16, uh, that was their target mission, not Apollo 15, um, as it would eventually come to be. Um, and so each of these systems would pose its own unique problems for the rover engineers. Let me move on then from the wheels to the, to the crew station. And principally, I wanted to, to talk about the, uh, the, t the T handle, um, which was the way that the astronauts in their sort of suited gloves would, would drive and operate uh, the uh, lunar rover. Now, the rover was actually uh, essentially the first proper drive-by-wire vehicle, um, at least small vehicle. NASA's crawler, which was the vehicle that would take the um, stacked rockets out to the launch pad was actually another drive-by-wire vehicle, but a very different sort of drive-by-wire machine um, compared to the, uh, the Lunar Rover, which um, uh, created technologies, of course, that many of us have in our cars today. Um, uh, NASA's stipulation, of course, with, um, with this was that the, the astronauts would sit side by side and either one of them should be able to operate the vehicle from that position. Um, so something central had to be, neat, had to be uh, designed uh, to actually uh, control the lunar rover. A wheel, a, a steering wheel, was not thought to be practical because it would have inhibited ingress and egress, getting in and out of the, on and off the, um, uh, the, the vehicle. And so it was thought that a, a joystick control would be um, uh, preferable uh, with a kind of multifunctionality to it. But in um, various tests of this, in the first sort of year of, of, of development, um, uh, you can see that actually to operate a joystick, you have to grip it quite hard uh, between your kind of thumb and your fingers. And, and gr that gripping action in a pressure suit is quite an intense activity for the lower arm muscles. And in the tests that they were doing, uh, in, the, in the fully suited uh, astronaut tests, the astronauts complained of lower arm fatigue quite quickly. Um, and so it wasn't long before um, a new design was um, quickly put together by a Tiger team working uh, rapidly around the clock for a, for a couple of months. Uh, and this was a far more uh, effective um, system to use for a suited astronaut. So there's even um, a place to kind of rest your forearm there and then you would just hang your, your hand on top of the T-handle just lightly and you pushed forward or leaned forward to go forward, leaned, pulled back to go backwards and leaned to the left or to the right to steer left or right. Um, and you could drive the whole thing with a completely relaxed arm. Um, and that was, that was quite a breakthrough and a sig significant turning point quite late on in the, um, in the rover's design. Um, there was a further braking mechanism by pushing down on it and, and, and coming, going backwards further, deeper into, into, the, um, into the mechanism, and that would sort of set the brakes on. Um, so a little bit about the steering, uh, which was uh, an Ackerman-type steering like um, cars are, which means that the inner um, wheels on the turning circle turn a, a little bit at a greater angle than the outer wheels to um, reflect the fact that they're turning a tighter circle. You can, you can see an action there. Um, this, uh, as it does on, on Earth as well, stops uh, outer wheel or the inner wheel being dragged across the surface by, by the oppo opposing wheel. Um, uh, the, uh, the steering was driven from um, a, a servo motor, uh, which you can see there, that uh, operated uh, with a very, a very cog system uh, that allowed you to go from lock to lock in 5.5 seconds, which uh, apparently created quite a lively ride, because the other thing I haven't mentioned is, of course, it steered both front and back. 
Uh, this wasn't just to make it turning circle very tight, but it was also um, a fail-safe, a redundancy built into it, so that, as was the case in Apollo 15, if um, the front wheels didn't steer, uh, the back ones would. Um, uh, more about that a, a bit later. So uh, a note on, on the power, what would power it? Well, as we saw earlier on, some of the science fiction ideas for, for lunar rovers were electrically powered. Um, a, Von Braun had experimented with a peroxide engine um, during his work on the, v, the V2 missiles, and uh, that was thought to be impractical for a lunar roving vehicle. The internal combustion engine was considered taking your own oxygen supply with you, but that would have been too heavy, and the pollution that it would have produced would have um, perhaps had an effect on some of the other experiments. Fuel cells were also considered to, to power the lunar rover, but the pressurised tanks that would be needed for the fuel cell were thought to be uh, unwieldy for such a small vehicle. Nuclear power, as um, is being effectively used at the moment on the Curiosity rover, uh, would have uh, also been far too heavy, um, particularly for the speeds that, and the torque that they, they, they were trying to re get on the rover. So the batteries were, um, were decided to, to, to be used, and silver oxide zinc batteries um, with a yield of 36 uh, volts, um, or 8 uh, kilowatt hours for the whole mission, were, um, were specced out in the end. And just to put that into perspective... Um, uh, a, a, a Prius has about 1.3 kilowatt hours um, of, of total power, and a Tesla sports car something like 56. And so um, the eight kilowatt hours is sort of, well, somewhere nearer the Prius, I suppose. Um, incidentally, it was also eight kilowatt hours was three to four times longer than would ever actually be needed um, for a mission. But again, it was another fail-safe mechanism. Oh, just before we go into that, let me say something briefly to introduce that clip. Um, there was a, uh, one factor that was harder than anything else uh, when it came to um, familiarising the astronauts with the rover, and that was that they couldn't drive a 1 6th G rover on the surface of the Earth because it wasn't strong enough. Um, and so other solutions for training had to be found. Well, navigation, of course, was another challenge. Um, the Apollo 14 astronauts famously had got lost on their walk to Cone Crater just uh, months before Apollo 15 would take the lunar rover far further from the lunar module. And with no landmarks or magnetic fields, um, something uh, significant had to be done technologically to, to achieve a navigation system for them. Um, there were two... Uh, Two solutions to the design that were rejected by NASA very early on in, um, in GM and Boeing's uh, introduction to the, to the rover. One of them was the deployment mechanism, which I'll come on to in a moment. And the other one was the navigation system, which initially was a very intricate system of gyroscopes uh, that um, was based on the gyroscopic navigation system for the lunar module and the command module. And it wasn't popular with NASA or the astronauts who all felt that it was just too complicated and prone to failure. Um, being pilots... They just pushed for something far simpler, the astronauts. All they really wanted was a heading and a distance recorder, and they would do the rest by dead reckoning. And the final system actually um, uh, just had sort of three main subsystems to it, an odometer um, that uh, recorded um, the, uh, the speed and uh, distance, and a signal processing unit, um, and a display console, which you can see just here. Um, the um, odometer worked on a, a process of nine magnets uh, around the rear right wheel that gave nine pulses as the wheel rotated, um, allowing speed data to, to be displayed. Um, now, you didn't actually need... Uh, you can see the, the speed meter there. You didn't actually need speed data to navigate, but being um, uh, throttle jockeys, uh, they were all quite keen to um, try and outdo each other in terms of, sort of speed records on the moon, so they, they put it on sort of for, for, for fun, really. Um, the, um, the other systems, though, uh, for, um, uh, for, for navigation were more significant. So, for example, distance and bearing were key to uh, getting back to the, lunar, the, safety, the relative safety of the lunar module should anything uh, go, go awry. And the hard bit about establishing distance accurately um, was that, of course, as you saw in that previous clip, the wheels tended to kind of lift off the ground. They would spin in the air or they would drag and they would skid. And the distance, therefore, was a difficult thing to calculate accurately. And so what the signal processing unit ended up doing was that it would take um, the third fastest wheel average all the way along, calculating to kind of um, uh, work out that, that, that average 
um, uh, record from the nine uh, counters on, 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 on that wheel. And it would compare them the whole time, just take that third um, fastest average to calculate the distance. And in various tests on Earth, they found that was uh, accurate enough. Um, Um, the outcome of that test, then, um, and the redesign that followed, uh, actually introduced a semi-manual hand crank deployment system just for occasions such as that. If anything got stuck, you could very slowly kind of wind the thing down to the surface rather than it deploying by, in one sprung mechanism. And um, this uh, hand crank system was also important in case the lunar module landed at an angle which meant that it had to be lowered even further to actually touch its wheels onto the surface. It, it had some more flexibility to it as a system. So against the odds, it was delivered with just um, a month short of the 18-month cutoff. Um, and uh, at the top there, inside the lunar module, somewhere in that, that little section there, then on the 26th of July, 1961, on board Apollo 15, LRV-1 left the Earth, destined for the Moon, where it would appear... Um, landing near Hadley Rail three days later. Well, um, a little bit of the performance there. Um, but o over, the, over the course of the that mission and the next two missions, the lunar rovers then, one, two, and three, would take uh, the astronauts to sites of very special geological interest. This um, shorty crater, four kilometers distant from the lunar module, um, a major goal of Apollo 17. And... Um, this portrait from, from Station 7 uh, with a view across the Taurus Litro Valley, one of the last pictures taken on the moon, and um, they are so far from the lunar module, it's just a tiny speck in the distance over there, um, really kind of out on the edge. Um, apologies for the, uh, the kilograms, I should say 20, 40, 60, 80 here, up here, but the, you'll get the idea here. Um, the masses of samples returned by mission, these were the on-foot missions, uh, and then the rover um, uh, enabled them to collect far more geological samples. Um, some speed performance data then from um, Apollo 16, John Young claimed, or claims, 17 kilometers per hour, uh, and uh, Gene Cernan trumped him with 17 and a half to 18 kilometers per hour downhill, potentially, um, uh, on Apollo 17. Um, and here, these odometer distances, um, with, the, with the maximum distance traveled on Apollo 17 at uh, just under 35 kilometers, um, totaling almost 90 kilometers of, uh, of driven um, distance on the moon during those three J-class missions. Um, and that was a record, curiously, um, that only lasted for a few months because um, the following year, in 1973, Lunacod 2 uh, managed 37 kilometers, which is a record that I think still stands but might be broken later uh, this year by um, opportunity if it can struggle on uh, for a few more months. I think uh, those figures uh, were as of um, December last year. Um, of course, the lunar roving vehicle informed the design of the later rovers um, from uh, Sojourner um, to the Mars Exploration Rovers and to Curiosity that's um, just landed uh, a, a few months ago, back in August uh, last year. Um, and Curiosity is probably going to um, break the record. It's still, you know, only travelled uh, un under a kilometre, I think, uh, since uh, its landing. Um, but it's undoubtedly going to um, break that Lunacod 2 record in, in the coming uh, five years or so, maybe longer. Um, beyond these craft, then, the Chinese have Chang 3E, which is heading for the moon supposedly this year. Um, and NASA have got their five-wheeled athlete, athlete rover, pictured in the bottom right there, that's again informed from designs that were pioneered from the lunar roving vehicle and might possibly return to the moon at an unspecified time. Um, but I think, you know, the development of these uh, semi-autonomous vehicles um, perhaps is, um, provides the greatest single stimulus to the evolution of mechanical intelligence. Um, taking these designs from the lunar rover and giving them uh, a brain is, is, is something that really does catapult us to, to greatness. And perhaps, I think, is one of the greatest legacies of uh, the Apollo lunar roving vehicle. Thank you very much.
Uh, one of the things that interests me is that the weight cut, because on the original design of the lunar module, they were so concerned about weight, the weight about the windows and so on. I mean, how did they get over that problem? I mean, did they really have to make the lunar module sort of much more sturdy or what? Um, it was beefed up during the J-Class missions because it had to carry a greater weight of equipment and supplies to the surface for the longer stays in the mountains of the moon. So, yes, there was, there was some extra weight that was, was added to sort of strengthen it to be able to carry these extra kind of masses. Um, and that obviously required, therefore, the whole stack to be sort of beefed up as well because um, the, the lifting capabilities of the Saturn V had to be raised as well. I mean, the, 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 the weight problem with the lunar rover, it, as with all of the Apollo hardware, um, it was a very, very tight weight budget, which they were always over. And in fact, they always, like the other, the other companies, had these um, scrape and save programs where they would just um, uh, lay the way more and more metal from all of the components until they were just on the edge of breaking. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, um, uh, uh, it's often forgotten because of the uh, events on Apollo 13 that happened the same week. Um, the, the week of Apollo 13, the chassis snapped under tests here, and they were quite a long way into their build program by then, uh, and they realized they'd scraped a bit too far. Um, they, they had another um, incentive program where uh, I think um, if, if you came up with an idea for saving weight, then there was um, a cash incentive that, that, that you were given, a $25 check or something, which in the 60s, I suppose, was, was a bit worth a bit more. Um, but they were always, as I say, up against this. And in the end, NASA um, bowed to their problems and, and gave them a little bit of an extra kind of weight allowance to allow them to kind of come in. The hardest problem was the batteries, which were kind of a quarter of the weight of the entire thing. Battery technology, um, as is today, is still a, a major limiting factor. Um, uh, and it was tough all the, all, all the way through. It caused a lot of stress and heart attacks, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I suspect one of, the, um, one of the ways of doing things that wouldn't carry on to another major um, roving vehicle development would be the management. Uh, 1970s NASA was very deep in its hierarchy. Some of the people on those videos testing vehicles were probably working around about the 13th level down from the NASA administrator. With you know, very long chains of command, very slow, usually, although I was quite surprised to find that these things were done within uh, the order of a year. But I think if something similar was done now, you know, maybe a Titan rover or something like that, I think the, I think the hierarchies would be a lot less. Uh, a lot more bottom-up um, decision-making instead of everything going right to the top. Yes, it's an interesting observation. I mean, Apollo project management is a science in itself, and the, there are books on it, in fact, because uh, you've got to remember that they did marshal the combined work of 400,000 people for a decade. That was no mean feat, and you do need a few hierarchies to do that, although, admittedly, um, working practices and business theory has changed since then. But I think... Um, you've also got to look at the, 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 uh, the difference in, in deadlines and schedules that they, they were operating against. You flag that up. I mean, 17 months to create a brand new spacecraft capable of that. I think you'd be hard pushed to do that today with current sort of structures and computing capability just because of health and safety, if nothing else. Um, but but, but that, that aside, I, I, I think there, w there were certain efficiencies of, of that sort of scale um, that came into their own with the, with the, with the rover. Maybe, um, I mean, 17 levels or whatever you said it was, of uh, uh, 13 levels of management clearly um, uh, comes with its own problems, of course. Um, I mean, the other miraculous thing was this was all done in a culture of memos because you know, there wasn't any electronic forms of communication in those days. It was just dozens of memos flying around the whole time. And it, the in, you think your in-tray, your email in-tray looks bad now. Remember what those memo in-trays looked like in those days. They were pretty, pretty stressful. <laughs> um, but there's a lot to be learnt, I think, as well as, you know, thrown out. I don't think you can kind of chuck it all away and say, well, you know, a, f a finer structure is better, the better way forward. There, there's, there, was good, there were good parts to what they did. Not least their stand-up meetings, I think, which they had every morning where, with no chairs. There's a lot to be said for taking the chairs out of meeting rooms, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, at least one replica, full-size replica of the lunar rail was made at the time. So it obviously couldn't be the same as the, one, the ones actually used on the moon because it was able to collapse. 
I remember it being put on show at the at the, uh, at the motor show in London, and I I lived in Sheffield at the time and dashed to London to see it. Well, and uh, any idea what happened to those replicas? You know? Well, so yes, there were there were four commissions, although the last ones for Apollo eighteen and maybe nineteen even were ca- were cancelled. But by the time they were cancelled after the Apollo. 13 disaster. Um, LRV-4 was quite a long way towards being completed. Um, they didn't complete it and they, they used it as spares for the other three, LRV-1, 2 and 3. But as part of the deliverables for, for each of the lunar roving vehicles, I think there were something like seven or eight other vehicles that they had to, to deliver as well. And some of them were, there was a 1 6th G um, simulator 16 g model, you saw it in one of those deployment videos when it was springing out, um, that was used to, 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 um, to study the effectiveness of their deployment mechanism. Um, uh, and it was a much lighter structure, but it was there to simulate uh, a sixth of what, what the, um, the other ones would weigh uh, weighed on Earth. There were the training vehicles, the 1G trainer, of course, which was often exhibited around the world, and people thought they were seeing um, a 1.6G model, but it was a 1G uh, trainer with, with 1.6G wheels on that were sort of then jacked up to support it. So it might have been that one that was on show at Ells Court, I don't know. There were various road legal ones as well that um, were, were converted. In fact, um, uh, the, the, the singer in Jamiroquai, JK, owns one, I think. Um, the BBC's film, filmed him in, in it before, or James May driving it. But um, there are a couple of others that are, that are like that. And they've done, them, done various stunts with them over the years to promote General Motors and and uh, Boeing, in fact. Um, but they're all scattered around the world. I mean, they're in various um, air and space museums in, in, in America, some of these, um, I think, to answer your question. Yes? I do actually remember the Science Museum had one, but I don't know where it came from. It must be just after the Apollo program. I know that time I can tell you. Apollo 10 capsule. It was our one, the BBC one. Sorry? Oh, there you go. It was the BBC one. Was it? Was it used in the studios yeah, then, well, Matt? Patrick, yes, yes, I know precisely what happened to it. I, when I let it be in '93, it was in the car park under a cover. I said, "If you're going to get rid of it, let me know," and they didn't. <coughs> and it's probably in some landfill somewhere. Yeah, you should bring that. Yeah, find the landfill. Is it? No, sorry about that. But it, it, was, it was an accurate full size one. It was one you saw in the studio with uh, James and Patrick. I've actually got photographs of it that I took on the slide for years ago. It was even years ago. Yeah, we went to Science Museum for ages and I got it back because um, Scott Knight wanted it. Well, there you go. Maybe we should start a Facebook campaign to try and dig it out of the landfill. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Was, was dust any sort of problem? Yes, you're quite right. Thanks for asking. Well, so um, they were quite a late stage addition to, to the design, but the fenders that were put on the mudguards, if you like, uh, uh, that wrapped around all four wheels were really kind of key. Um, not so much, interestingly, because the dust flying everywhere was, was, it, was, it, was a big problem to obscuring the drive, but because of thermal regulation. This dust is very dark. It has a very low ab- albedo. And... Um, on the two occasions where um, accidentally they broke the fenders um, on the Apollo 16 and 17, I think, um, uh, they tried driving without the, 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 the full fender for um, a few station stops. And the dust that was being thrown up was landing on the battery cases and the battery covers and on their suits as well. And um, it put an extra strain on the sort of thermal... Um, absorption, the heat absorption that the rover was kind of designed to cope with and it pushed it outside of the margins and there was an overheating problem on the batteries on Apollo 16 consequently. Um, And so that's why famously they kind of cobbled together these these homemade fenders, if you like, using gaffer tape and geological maps that were sort of assembled a bit like the kind of Apollo 13 sort of... um, uh, redesigns on the fly that, that, that were done um, through Tiger teams working back at Mission Control and then up, uploading the kind of procedures to fix them. And that's why they were really needed. Um, yeah, the dust w- was, a, was a problem principally for that reason. Although its abrasive qualities were also troublesome in the suits and in the suit joints when they were really sprayed with them. But on later missions, those suit joints actually cope quite well with falling over quite a lot. Did you do any trouble to bear it? No, they were all sealed units. So one of the things I also didn't mention is that each of the electric motors, there were four electric motors, one in each wheel, and they were sealed into the hubs of the wheel. So there was no danger of dust 
penetration into there. Um, and the rest of it largely being unmechanical and being dried by wire was also rather sort of immune to dust. But it was the thermal problems which um, were the challenge when the dust was flying. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Alan, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was a lubricating fluid, a cooling fluid. I forget um, the, the chemical details of it now, but um, yeah, th those motors, they all had um, uh, temperature monitors on them and they were displayed on the console so you could, you could see what temperature <coughs> the motors were running at. But I think I'm right in saying on none of the, on none of the drives for almost 90 kilometres did they... Um, did they overheat and cause overheating problems? No. The, 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 the only real thermal problem, in fact, was that, was that battery one that I mentioned. Um, and the interesting thing that I hinted at, which was that um, to, to, to keep the battery temperatures pretty regulated because you didn't want them getting very hot or very cold, they used these, these wax reservoirs so that when the batteries were overheating, it melted the wax and that, uh, that melting action took some of the latent heat out of the battery. And then... Um, importantly, equally importantly, was to keep the batteries at an operating temperature when the thing was sort of parked in the shade uh, in during sleep periods, the shade of the lunar module. And so this wax would then solidify during those periods and give back its latent heat, and that would keep the, the, the batteries warm. And a really ingenious design, and one that was several centuries old, in fact. It was well known as a pro property of wax that it could do that. Nice little touch. Uh, yes, in the middle there. It, it looks like in the images that the steering pad is working again on, on all four wheels. Is that correct? Y yes, they joked that, um, that the folks from, uh, from General Motors have been up there in the night and fixed it because <laughs> it, it wasn't really understood and still not properly understood to this day why it suddenly started working. They tried everything, went through several procedures and wasted sort of 25, 30 minutes trying to fix it before they decided the price per minute on the moon was high and they abandoned that idea. They drove for the first day on the rear wheel steering only. Um, which was still fine, and they practiced and rehearsed for single, single wheel steering rather than four wheel steering, double wheel steering rather than four wheel steering, and it was it was okay, it operated fine, and they parked it in the shade of the lunar module that first sleep period, and probably it had gone through a period of kind of cooling and heating, and that had just loosened something in it. But when they got on it the next day, it worked fine. But Boeing, incidentally, had this terrible contract with NASA where if they got it to the moon and uh, it didn't work, then they lost their, their, their pay. Effectively, all of their profit would have, would have been eroded. And it wasn't much anyway because they'd sort of underbid on it anyway. And so their hearts were in their mouths, as you saw in that clip, when, when this thing wasn't working because essentially, you know, it was an enormous loss, enormous hit to the company financially if that thing hadn't worked. And thank goodness they'd put, um, you know, a fail-safe steering system in where they could still operate it. There was big relief all around, I think, for that. Yeah. There was a question over here. Or, yes, at the back, yeah. Uh, Oh, that's a, that's a very good question, that. And so um, it was a bit cheeky, the, the way we cut the documentary there, because um, you're right, Prin principally there was a live camera feed, the, co the colour camera that you saw the feed from when they were pulling it off the lunar module, pulling the, the rover down onto the surface. And that was locked off on a, on a tripod, so that everyone at Mission Control could see that. It was a few seconds behind, but they could see the progress visibly, as well as listening to it on the commentary, uh, the comms, the audio comms. At that point then, uh, you, you actually just saw it driving off. It just drove off out of shot as Dave Scott brought it right around the lunar module and then pulled it up again, which you don't see, um, for them to, to load it up. So they got, they got a view of it just driving out of shot and were very excited about it then. The point of view shots then that we used extensively for the rest of that sequence, intercut with the mission audio, were all shot from their chest-mounted 16mm DAC cameras, the data acquisition cameras. And they were, would not have been seen in Mission Control at all. Mission Control were in the dark at that point. They were listening to the whoops of delight from the crew as they were kind of riding off on this thing and reporting back audibly, but they couldn't see anything. Now, interestingly, if you watch the, um, the video downlink for all of those J-Class missions, 
there are really charming fleeting moments where the, um, the live TV camera remains switched on as they drive off. And you just get a few seconds before the picture breaks up because the high gain antenna is very directional and it has to be pointed exactly back at the Earth for the picture to be clear. And that's fine when the rover's parked stationary, but as this thing drives off, it would be like trying to pick up you know, Sky TV with your dish on the car. You, know, it, it just, you just lose the picture. But just for those fleeting few seconds, you sometimes just got a little glimpse of the live shot of driving off and then it would go black and you wouldn't see anything until they got to the next station and repointed the dish again. Does that answer your question? Yes, more or less. So, so, um, well, just to, make, to clarify, you're saying that the film that we watched was actual film, but the picture that we took was video. Correct. It was taken by the day recreation cameras mounted on the astronaut's chest. Yes. So where did they put the Hasselblads? So the Hasselblads were under their seats. The stills cameras were stowed during the drives. Um, I didn't talk about stowage much, but there was stowage both under the, the collapsible seats and around their feet, and in um, the section at the back, a boot, if you like, that was open to the elements, but that they stowed their, their tools in and they put the rock samples in afterwards as well. So, yeah, there's another good question. The Hasselbads were in those, those stowage boxes and they were all carefully marked as to where to place them to keep them dust free. So those uh, DOC cameras were operating at 24 frames a second? Varied. Sometimes they put them on at five or six, for, uh, depending on kind of what they were filming, and at sometimes... At other times, it was, yes, it's it probably 24, I would say, maybe 15, between 15 and 24. They were trying to conserve film, of course, all the way along, so they often ran them slower than, than we'd be used to in the cinema, as it were. Thank Thanks for your questions, yeah. Um, oh, yes, hi, yeah. Correct. Yes, they were. Uh, it's another good, good question. The contingency was always to, to walk back if they had a breakdown. But the, th the, the, the thing that they always did was, even though they were driving quite circuitous routes to kind of get to a, the most distant station, the most distant station stop, geological station stop, was always within walking distance back with those current um, consumables that they, they were constantly monitoring back at Mission Control and, uh, and themselves as well. They knew how much air they got for a exertion for a walk back. Uh, and they, they never went outside those boundaries, so they were never further than they could walk back. But what the rover enabled them to do was to, to still travel a lot further and do a lot more and collect more samples, as we saw in the slides. Um, so even though they could have walked back, it, it was still a huge asset um, and an advantage to the scientific returns of all of those final three missions. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's okay. So they were from a documentary which you can buy called Moon Machines. It's a six-part series, six one-hour films um, for the Discovery Science Channel. You can buy it from Amazon. And the Dis Discovery sells it. It's it's one of their best sellers. I'm pleased to say, not that not that they pay me anything for that, but um, but yes, it was a spin-off series that we did after we made In the Shadow of the Moon. Um, these six one-hours about the engineers. I'm pleased to say there's not a single astronaut in that series. It's just about the 400,000 men and women that made the, that dream of Apollo a reality, and it's their stories. Um, there's a film on the Saturn V, on the command module, the lunar module, um, the space suits, the Apollo guidance computer, and then that final sixth episode on the lunar rover. Um, yeah, um, I'm sure you'd enjoy it. <laughs> okay, um, two more questions? Uh, yes, happy to take two more if there are any, yeah. They always have the same visual range of the lens. They, in theory, I think were supposed to, but actually often it was quite hard to see, and particularly with the undulations of the lunar terrain. When you started your walk back, you, were, you would probably lose sight of it quite often. Um, the, the way that they, they were confident of, of walking back was not to follow the tyre tracks, but because they, had, they constantly had those distance and bearing measurements through triangulation through that uh, navigation system to, to point them straight back to the, to the lunar module. So they could pretty much dead reckon in a straight line back um, but um, that relied on the sort of faith of the data that they had and not the visibility of the lunar module which they would have lost progressively yeah, there were in fact various times on the on part 17 when the lunar module was below uh, a hill or something that uh, they from part um, I mean the whole thing bears an incredible testament to the astronaut's reliability on the hardware 
and uh, put their faith in what these people have put together to provide this equipment for them. It is an incredible achievement. Yes, what, what I think I marvelled at most when writing this book was that, uh, in fact, um, after Apollo 13, you know, they could have just said, right, you know, we're stopping, or, you know, we'll do one more Apollo 14 mission just to show we, we've, we can get back on the horse, and that is it. And instead, what, what they did, um, despite public opinion and um, the, the, the pressure from, from Washington, was that they not only went back, but they pressed on with this lunar rover and they, they took those three vehicles to the, to the moon and returned all of those extra samples and drove n- almost 90 kilometers and explored terrain that we would never have got to reach and, and chart with, without them. And that, um, despite what you might sort of think of the inefficient 13 tiers of management at NASA, was, was something I think that's still worth sort of celebrating today. That's an extraordinary turnaround from disaster to sort of triumph, I think, and something that's very inspiring. Yes. So MOLAB was um, always a feasibility study on Earth and never one. I mean, I think the guys that worked on it thought and hoped it might one day fly to the moon, of course. But um, NASA never gave it a green light to to go there and they never had plans to send a three and a half ton (coughs) rover to the moon. Interestingly, um, one of the competing designs uh, designed by Grumman, (coughs) who were the company that built the lunar module, uh, they had an extraordinary cone wheel design you might have, have seen some of it on, on youtube which also in some respects was better than that 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 sort of piano wire wheel that gm had come up with because um it it didn't throw up as much dust rocks and dust sometimes rolled into the cone and then rolled out again because of the, the sort of conical design um, and this thing had it was made of a sort of flexible um polycarbonate so it kind of f- really folded and crunched right up so you could fold it small even though it was bigger and the Grumman rover went through various incarnations, one of which was um, uh, a, a remote-controlled version as well. And so you could have parked that rover, blasted off, brought the human crew back, and then had a usable, robotically-controlled rover on the moon for another month of, of operations. That battery would have, would have run another 30 days. And they seriously considered that as a, as a, as a kind of concept um, uh, until very late on, until um, Grumman was sort of thrown out of the, the process and GM and Boeing were, were taken forward. And, and GM and Boeing's rover didn't have any of those ambitions about it. It was, you park it there, it films the launch, which of course is how we got the, the launch footage from those platforms of, of the rovers parked a bit further away. And that was it. And um, no, so there were no further plans to kind of go back with anything larger. Uh, j- j- one more point from Jerry. Yeah, there was a plan at one stage to have the, the, the rover being able to be remotely controlled from Earth so that we could actually drive it after one mission to the intended landing point of the next mission <laughs> so that it would be there and they could use it, not only to save the money, but it would mean you saved the mass on launch so you can carry more uh, experiments on it. But they decided that there was no fail safe on it. If it didn't manage to get there, then it's quite a long drive between Apollo sites, I think, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it just, yes. I think it was you that identified, you flagged up last this time last year, actually, I, the talk I saw you give, Jerry, about this record-breaking drive and whether, you know, um, the uh, Mars Exploration Rover would outstrip Apollo, but of course, I don't think you mentioned Lunacod 2 then, but um, it's an interesting turning point where robots are just about to sort of outstrip the, 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 well, the, that, that fantastic... Uh, uh, it's true. They certainly have, yeah. Uh, I saw a wonderful cartoon of the two astronauts on the, on the rover who've been stopped by an alien cop, and they're saying, gee, officer, we haven't had a drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty dry place, isn't it? Um, Well, look, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak to you again and for for coming along tonight. I'm very happy to sign books and um, uh, talk to you more if you want to come up to the front. Sorry, I was just going to say thank you uh, for coming along and thanks for an absolutely fascinating uh, talk. And uh, I think we've all... uh, Thank you.